much. First, I'd like to thank the organizers for giving me this opportunity to tell you about some of the recent work we've been doing to explore uh, churn bands and the prospects of seeing fractionalized excitations in these systems. You know, condensed matter systems, one of the remarkable things about it is that they do offer uh, the possibility of observing fractionalized excitations. Uh, and basically this means that the underlying fundamental particles in the system no longer resemble uh, the electrons that make them or constitute the system, but rather uh, really very different type of excitations exist in the system. And perhaps one of the more familiar examples is the fractional quantum Hall effect where large magnetic fields, very low temperatures. Uh, one observes fractionalized excitations where the charge in the system, for example, at filling factor one third becomes one third of an electron. So today I'd like to tell you about some uh, of the work that we've been doing that explores the prospects of seeing these excitations, but at much lower magnetic fields and perhaps where the magnetic field is no longer playing a critical role in their uh, existence. So let's start just by reminding everybody about the integer and fractional quantum Hall effect. Integer quantum Hall effect, of course, is a result of a two-dimensional electron system subject to a very strong perpendicular magnetic field. We know that under these conditions, Landau levels form. These are the density of states of this Landau levels. And when the Fermi energy lies in the gap between Landau levels, the transverse conductivity gets quantized in units of E squared over H uh, with a multiplicative factor that is an integer. Of course, when the Fermi energy lies within one of these gaps, the conductivity is no longer quantized. But if interactions are present, the system may choose to open up a correlated gap where now uh, the transverse conductivity becomes quantized in a fraction of E squared over H and this C, this churn number that I'll talk more about uh, becomes uh, a fraction uh, of, of an integer, a, a simple fraction of an integer. And as we can see here, uh, the route for obtaining these fractional uh, quantum Hall conductivity uh, relies on the fact that the magnetic field, first of all, flattens the bands, it removes the kinetic energy from the system, and also, uh, as we'll see, endows the bands some underlying topology. Uh, fractional quantum Hall effect is still a very vibrant topic. Uh, you know, recently there has been some nice measurements showing um, ionic statistics associated with fractionalized excitations. My personal interest in the fractional quantum Hall effect per se is in combining it with superconductivity to explore non-abelian excitations that might emerge. Uh, so it is, despite the fact that we're 40 years after, it's really still a very vibrant field. But today I'm gonna talk about um, the prospects of seeing similar physics to that seen in the fractional quantum Hall effect, but actually not as a result of a strong magnetic field that drives the phenomena. So the breakthrough that uh, basically was made in order to understand the current, uh, the, the current state of the field uh, was done in 1982 by these four authors, TKNNN. And uh, the idea there was uh, to consider this two-dimensional system on a torus. And what this does is basically this system, so the electrons live on the surface of this torus. There is a strong magnetic field at any given point that is perpendicular to the torus. But there are two, very, two knobs that one can control in the system. And these are de de designated here by these two fluxes, one through the hole and one inside the, the, the torus itself, phi x and phi y. And obviously because the system is periodic and these components, we can basically look at how the wave functions in the system here u are parameterized by these two flux variables. And what was noted by these authors is that one can look at uh, a quantity here, which is uh, denoted here by a, it resembles a vector potential uh, that looks at the derivative of these matrix elements of these wave functions with respect to the flux parameters, basically analyzing how these wave functions change when you change the flux. 
And based on this analogous to a vector potential, one can define what's called a Berry curvature, which resembles a magnetic field. Um, and this is given by the curl of this vector potential here. And the interesting thing that they were able to show is that the transverse conductivity in the system can be uh, written as the integral over this phase space of these parameters phi, uh, that gives you the churn number, which is an integer number. And basically it parameterizes um, the topology in the system. Uh, in recent years, you know, not so recent, but recent years, it became clear that this kind of topological properties exist also in systems that have discrete translational symmetry, uh, namely bands in condensed matter systems, where now we can parameterize the wave functions in the system as a function of the in-plane k vectors, kx and ky. And of course, these are all, again, periodic because we're going to be looking at the first uh, Brillouin zone. And so here, again, an analogy to what TK and N and N did, uh, we can define this vector potential, the derivatives of the wave functions with respect to the momentum inside the Brillouin zone, and the very curvature here, F, defined as the curl of that. And it turns out that these bands, therefore, can have a finite churn number, namely a finite transverse conductivity, even in the absence of an external magnetic field. So it's zero magnetic field, that is defined as the integral over the entire phase space of this Berry curvature. So this is really interesting. Of course, this produces integer churn bands. And the question is, is there a pathway to see fractional churn bands again in the absence of magnetic field? So the logic for fractional quantum Hall effect was, hey, we're gonna apply a very large magnetic field, but we're gonna fill one of these Landau levels that has an integer churn band integer churn value. Uh, we're going to partially fill it, and we might get a fractional, uh, a fractional quantized Hall state. The question now is, can we start out, even in the absence of magnetic field, with a band that has an integer churn value, fill up this band to a fractional uh, filling, and then due to the presence of interactions, would we be able to see a fractional churn insulator, all now at zero magnetic field? And starting from 2011, there has been a lot of theoretical work that predicted actually that this should be possible, that fractional churn insulators should exist in principle at zero magnetic field. And of course, this is one of the holy grails of the field of uh, topological matter is to see the role of interactions in these systems. And one of their manifestations is uh, the possibility of having fractional churn insulators. So our motivation, of course, is number one, to be able to see if we can observe such states. Uh, of course, uh, the other interesting thing is that once you see these type of correlated states, you might encounter other correlated states. And I'll say a little bit about what we're seeing uh, towards the end of the talk beyond just the simple fractional churn insulators. So the way we are probing these systems is using uh, 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 basically a measurement technique that allows us to probe the inverse compressibility in the system. And this is basically a measurement of the change in chemical potential per change in density. And it's a local probe. And one of the remarkable things that we were able to figure out is that despite that this is a local probe, it measures a property uh, within an area of maybe 100 nanometers square underneath this tip, we're nonetheless able to extract the topological number, which is a property of the full band uh, using this method. But before I explain how this is done to measure churn numbers using this technique, let me just mention that this technique has carried us really quite far in terms of our ability to say something about two-dimensional systems, especially ones that have gaps in them. We were able to measure directly the presence of fractional charge using this technique. Uh, in the fractional quantum Hall regime, not in these churn systems, but in the fractional quantum Hall regime, namely at very large magnetic fields, we're able to see a multitude of particles, uh, holes, and electrons coexisting. For example, in graphene, both uh, electron and hole puddles, the, their coexistence. We are able to follow phase transitions. Uh, what's shown in this image here are phase transitions, in fact, that are due to spin. 
So these are actually spin phase transitions that occur within the fractional quantum Hall states. Recently, we employed this technique to see the binding of electron charge to neutral excitations, namely spin waves to form skirmions. And for today's talk, I'm gonna solely be talking about the measurement of local churn numbers uh, and the study of uh, these churn, uh, churn bands in twisted uh, graphene matter. So what is the idea? How can we extract um, the churn numbers? So one thing I have to emphasize, I'm not gonna explain in detail how the technique works. I'm just gonna tell you that uh, what the technique is most sensitive to are energy gaps in the system. So if the system has an energy gap, uh, and you can tune the density in the system to be in the gap, then the signal that this probe picks up is a very large signal. So our signal to noise is largest when the density of states is smallest. So this means that following energy gaps in the system is really, really easy. And one of the things that Streda uh, realized, again, a good number of years ago, is that in a system that has a quantized Hall effect, sigma xy, uh, and it's described by this churn number C. Obviously the system, because it has a quantized churn number, it means that you have some full bands and you have some empty bands and the Fermi energy lies in the gap. But what Strata realized is that if you now change the density in the system, you may need to change the magnetic field in proportion to that density in order to maintain the Fermi energy in the gap. And the ratio of magnetic field to density that's required to keep the system inside the gap in units of flux quantum is precisely the churn number. In effect, it's a measurement, a direct measurement of sigma xy. So here, for example, in this uh, plot on the right, you see a measurement where bright signal means we're in the gap. And you can see the density is changing on the horizontal axis, magnetic field is changing in the vertical axis, and you see that there is a straight line that's required to satisfy in order to maintain the system in the gap. And the slope here, the ratio of this magnetic field to density in units of phi naught in this particular example is four. And you see that this slope persists all the way down to zero magnetic field, which was basically the first indication of a quantum anomalous Hall state in graph in bilayer graphene, uh, as shown by this uh, by this measurement here, but it's very very easy to extract what the churn number is simply by looking at the slope in real units of magnetic field to density. So the samples that I'm going to talk about today are twisted matter. I'm sure you've all heard many talks about twisted matter. It's really you know uh, a very interesting system where correlations and topology. In, play a very important role in defining the properties of the system. On the left is a sample that was fabricated for us to probe. And uh, first, let's start in looking at the behavior of this inverse compressibility when uh, we are at zero magnetic field. So this bottom plot here shows this inverse compressibility. And at any time you see a peak, you know you're in a gap. And the filling factor here is the, the, the filling factor of the bands. Obviously, since we have two layers uh, of graphene, uh, there are the unit cell consists of two valleys and two spins. So when we fill up the system, we can have a full filling of the all, all bands uh, up to a filling factor of four. And we see that the system develops gaps at integer fillings. Uh, on the electron side, on the whole side, we see a slightly different behavior. And this was explained by some very nice experiments and theory coming out of Weizmann Institute um, with a similar technique uh, known as the cascade picture. I'm not gonna be talking about that at all. So let's just focus on the peaks and the situation where the system has real gaps in the spectrum. By the way, if we integrate this derivative of chemical potential with density, we can obtain how the chemical potential is changing and we can extract the energy gaps in the system. And I wanna emphasize these are many body energy gaps. They're not tunneling gaps. Uh, they're really the energy required to add an electron to the system thermodynamically. So now we can start with this trace and basically take consecutive traces as we increase the magnetic field and construct a map. And what we find is this extremely rich arrangement of churn bands. Each time you see 
a bright signal following a slope in this plane, we know that that is a churn band with a finite sigma xy. And you see that some of these uh, slopes persist all the way down to zero magnetic field, suggesting that the system has a finite sigma xy, even at zero magnetic field, uh, basically breaking spontaneously time reversal symmetry. And I'll talk more about this. We can characterize each one of these features here uh, using a slope in units of phi naught and an offset. So where is the intercept of this line? And we can distill this data in the form shown here below. And you see here the richness of all the phases that we're observing, and I'll try to say something about all of them. Uh, so the black ones here is what we call integer quantum Hall effect or simple churn insulators. And you can see that they, uh, for example, near the charge neutrality, filling factor zero, we have a nice Landau fan. This is just your regular quantum Hall effect persisting down to relatively low magnetic fields. Uh, because the magnetic field generates Landau levels, and these are churn bands. But surrounding the integer filling, we see kind of a zoo of things. Some of these lines intercept not an integer filling. Uh, you can see the blue and yellow here. So these are denoted as symmetry broken churn insulators. I'll talk more about them. They have an integer slope, but fractional, but fractional intercept. And the red ones here are really where I'm heading in this talk, and that is the fractional churn insulators. They have a fractional slope, which means that this churn number is fractional, and they also have a fractional intercept, which um, has a very good reason. So what is the starting point to understand some of these features? So we're talking about twisted graphene layer in momentum space. Uh, we have a reduced Brillouin zone that has to do with the twisting of the two uh, original graphene uh, Fermi surfaces, and this leads us to having four Dirac points. And so the starting point to think about this system is a set of four Dirac points that are all protected by symmetry, and the symmetry is given by C2, rotation by 180 degrees, and time reversal symmetry. But now let's consider what happens when we break one of these symmetries. And the simplest one is to break uh, C2 rotation. This, of course, lifts the gap on these Dirac points, giving us eight bands, four conduction band, four valence bands. And the interesting thing is that now each one of these bands is a topological band, and it has a well-defined churn number. So this means that as I vary the magnetic field, I need to change the density. The number of states in these bands is changing with magnetic field in accordance with their churn number. And it could be a plus one or a minus one. So if we consider charge neutrality, for example, under the C2 symmetry breaking, and C2 symmetry breaking is not so hard to achieve. You just you can align your sample with boron nitrite. Uh, for example, that breaks C2 symmetry. Uh, so you see that if we place our Fermi energy in the gap and we are at the neutrality point, meaning that we have four full bands and four empty bands, the total churn number of the system is zero because we have two plus ones and two minus ones. And so the, the, the signal that we will be monitoring is the total churn band of the system and it's going to be zero, namely this is going to appear as a line in our density magnetic field space, which is just vertical. No density shift is needed as we ramp magnetic field. Let's consider what happens at filling factor three. So now we want to fill a, a total of three states out of four available states in the system. And of course, one way to do it is to fill out each one of the available conduction bands, uh, unfilled bands, to three quarters of its value. And this will give us a total filling of three with a democratic, uh, basically, uh, spreading of the charge among all the different bands. But of course, energetically, this is not favorable. And what the system would much rather do is fill completely three of the bands, leaving one empty. That also has a total filling of three. This obviously breaks the symmetry because we need to choose spontaneously which band we filled and which we left empty. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, so for example, if we leave the churn minus one band empty, the total churn of this system is plus one. And uh, it means that it breaks time reversal symmetry, obviously at zero magnetic field. And therefore, these are experiments done in uh, Santa Barbara. You can see indeed uh, that 
uh, this system behaves like a ferromagnet. It breaks time reversal symmetry and it has a stereosis as you scan magnetic field going between a Chern number of plus one to a Chern number of minus one as you ramp the magnetic field. Uh, so this is all making sense. We have a spontaneous breaking of time reversal symmetry when we're at filling factor three, and this has been nicely observed in transport. Another possibility of breaking symmetry is time reversal symmetry. So here it turns out that if you break time reversal symmetry, and this can be done by a magnetic field or again spontaneously, uh, then what happens is that the lower energy churn bands all have the same value plus one. The unoccupied churn bands will, let's say, have a churn value of minus one. And you see again, spontaneous breaking of time reversal symmetry will have to choose which ones are empty and which ones are full. But you see now that the churn value of this system at charge neutrality is four. So that's what's seen in this experiment. You see that charge neutrality, so it goes to zero field, zero density. It has a slope of four. If we now consider a filling of one, so we filled one of the empty bands, this will reduce the total churn number by one. So at filling factor one, we have a churn of three, and then of two and of one, and this is the manifestation of time reversal symmetry breaking. But one thing I want to note very kind of strongly, that regardless what the symmetry breaking mechanism, either C2 breaking or time reversal symmetry breaking, there is a sum rule that is preserved. And this sum rule says that the sum of the churn number and the filling is always even. And the reason, and you can see it from here, here we have a filling of uh, one and a churn band of, sorry, this is a filling of three and a churn of plus one and the sum is four. Here we have a filling of one and a churn of minus one. So the sum is zero or a churn of one, the sum is two. So anyway, the, the point is that the sum has to always be even. And the reason is that these churn bands, uh, the filling, is changing by one with each one of these bands and the churn value is changing by one with each one of these bands. So anytime you change the filling of each one of these bands, you're changing the sum by an even number. But if we look at our data, uh, and here it's kind of a little bit, uh, it doesn't show all the details, just to highlight uh, the point that I wanna make at this stage of the talk, look at some of these slopes here. The red ones are odd the odd sum of uh, basically the odd sum of churn and intercept. And we see that while we do see a lot of the even ones, which is what you expect, there are a lot of these states here that violate. So for example, here at filling three, we have a churn zero band. This can't be explained in the previous picture. At filling two, a churn of plus one. This cannot be explained. Uh, at all these negative fillings here in large magnetic fields, this is a slope of minus one, uh, sorry, an intercept of minus one, a slope of minus two. Again, this is an odd sum of the two factors. So the question is, where is this odd p-value coming from? So for this, we need to uh, consider additional spontaneous symmetry breaking that might occur in the system. So let's consider one of these bands as the starting point. So it has, let's say, a churn of plus one. And by the time we're away from charge neutrality, it means that we already fill the bands. And the moiré structure that has to do with this twisted graphene system, since it's there, the way the charge that we already put into the system when we're at filling factor one or two or three, uh, it turns out it doesn't distribute itself uniformly across in real space. It actually prefers sitting at some of the sites, the AA or the AB sites, in a non-uniform way. And what this does self-consistently is introduce another potential, think of it as a Hartree potential, and the band where it was originally rather flat becomes sub, be, uh, develops some dispersion. And the dispersion is heavily localized at the gamma points. So now the fact that we have no longer just very kind of flat bands, we have something that has a concentrated dispersion near the gamma points changes things a little bit in the interaction physics. And we can ask, well, suppose we wanna fill two of these bands, or sorry, we wanna fill uh, half filling of this band. We only wanna fill half of this band. So if we wanna fill half of this band, 
sorry, we want a, a full filling of a single flavor. What we want to do is we could either fill the entire band, but here we're paying quite a bit of kinetic energy because we have this large band dispersion. It's not that large, but it's larger than originally was believed to be. Alternatively, we can choose two different flavors and fill each one of them to the half value. This potentially would lower the energy because we're only filling near the gamma points for these two flavors. Now, if we're already happy filling half of the bands, then obviously if we can spontaneously reduce the Brillouin zone in the system to open a gap at half filling, then uh, we would lower the energy of these two half filled states even lower, like in a pyreless transition. So this is what's happening in this system. When we're at half filling, for example, uh, the system prefers to spontaneously break translational symmetry, double the unit cell, thereby reducing the Brillouin zone by a factor of two, and thereby uh, achieving uh, a lower energy state. And one of the interesting things is that if you look at how the Berry curvature, this thing that when you integrate it over the entire band gives you the churn number, in these bands, it's really highly concentrated also at the gamma point. So when you transition the system from one band to two bands in this reduced real one zone, you end up with two bands, one carrying the churn number, the original churn number, but the other having a zero churn number. And now we have much more combinations that we can use in order to realize uh, the violation of this sum rule that I was mentioning. And let's just see quickly how this looks like. So here, for example, we're looking at a total filling factor of three, but now each one of these bands is doubled because of this translational symmetry that occurred, uh, symmetry breaking that occurred. And so to fill out three of the bands, I need to fill six half bands. So I'm filling this one completely, this flavor completely, and this one completely, these ones only half and half. But you see that I obtained all the churn value that exists, leaving two half bands empty. So I can get a filling factor of three with a total churn number of zero, and that's an odd sum. And so on and so on. And we can reconstruct all the examples that we have here uh, based on this. So now I'd like to move on and look at slightly more exotic states, uh, the ones that have the fractional component to them, either a fractional intercept or a fractional slope. So here is a zoom in between filling factor three and four. Uh, where we see predominantly a churn one state intercepting at eight thirds, two and 2.66, and two churn zero states intercepting at three and a half and at three and two thirds. And we can use the same logic as before. When we have a denominator of two, we need to double the unit cell. And so what you can see here is doubling the unit cell. And now we can generate a filling of this system that would give us a total churn value of zero, namely it's vertical, and a filling of three and a half. So this is basically a, if you like, it's a charge density wave. It has a churn zero, it has a half integer filling, and it requires um, uh, the doubling of the unit cell. To get a denominator of three requires actually tripling of the unit cell. So the system again favors breaking the symmetry even further. Now we have each band break into three components and we can construct both states, a churn one with intercept at two and two thirds or a churn zero and a three and two thirds intercept. But if we follow these charge density wave states, these blue lines to a little bit higher field around five Tesla, we see that they transition to something that has a slope of two thirds and a intercept, which is also thirds. And the question is, what is the nature and origin of these states? And the only way to get a slope that is fractional is really by having a fractional churn insulator. There is really no other way. So what this means is that if I'm not breaking any symmetry, uh, in principle, you can imagine that I would fill three bands and one third. And if the Berry curvature is distributed uniformly across the band, then occupying a third of the band would give me a third of its Berry curvature, giving me a fractional churn band. And, and this is really the dichotomy. Now you can see why there is a competition between these states 
and the fractional ones. And the reason is that for the charge density wave states, the one that have a zero Chern number or an integer Chern number, uh, these actually require that the Berry curvature is concentrated at the bottom of the band. Because then when we uh, follow this uh, period doubling in the system, we can acquire the full churn number, giving us a total churn of zero and a fractional filling. Whereas the fractional churn states require a uniform distribution of the Berry curvature. Uh, and, and, um, and the question is, what controls it? So very briefly, I'm not going to talk much about this. Uh, there was some very nice theoretical work that was done uh, both recently in collaboration of our group and Ashvin's group, but slightly before that also, uh, that looks at the distribution of the Berry curvature across these bands. Uh, and it was done initially at zero magnetic field, so across this line here. And at zero magnetic field, one could also do um, exact diagonalization calculations to figure out what uh, what is the ground state in the system? And so there is a parameter here, W0 over W1. What this parameter tells you is what is the tunneling when you twist the system between the AA sites and the AB sites. And in practice, uh, you know, the system uh, in real life lives somewhere at this ratio of 0.7. But what you can see is that if you had a way of tuning it, at zero magnetic field, you would need to reduce the tunneling of the AA sites so that you would enter the uh, fractional uh, churn insulating ground states. What Ashvin and his group were able to do is to extend this calculation to finite magnetic fields. And what you see is that finite magnetic fields can play the same role as tuning this ratio. Namely, if we sit at a fixed value of this tunneling ratio, we see that at some low value of magnetic field, the distribution of the Berry curvature becomes flat. And we would enter a fractional churn insulating state. And that's exactly what's seen in the experiment. At low magnetic field, the Berry curvature is slightly uh, still concentrated at the gamma points, and that favors the charge density waves. As you turn on a magnetic field, what the magnetic field does is primarily flatten the Berry curvature. It doesn't open up Landau levels. That's not the role of the magnetic field. Unlike conventional fractional quantum Hall effect here, it just flattens the bands. Uh, it, it flattens the Berry curvature, distributes it uniformly, making the fractional churn insulating state a state that is favorable. So I'd like to basically pause here and uh, acknowledge the people who did the work. Uh, this is a collaboration between my group, Pablo's group, and Ashvin's group. Uh, and uh, with this, I'd like to stop and uh, see if there are any questions. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much uh, for a very informative talk. Uh, we have a question. First of all, Andrei Chubukov. Let me try to unmute. Yeah, okay, you can hear me, right? Yes. Yes. Hi, Mayor. Uh, Hi. Look, two simple questions. Let me ask both, and then you will answer in any order you want. First, about the discrepancy between hole doping and electron doping. You made some reference to work by Weizmann group, but still I want to hear your opinion why you see such nice sharp features at electron doping and much uh, blurrier features at hole doping. And second is a more in-depth question. You started by putting a nice picture about feeling one out of four bands essentially starting from non-interacting particles. And specifically, uh, I assume um, that for these particles, the minimum of the dispersion at charge neutrality is at Dirac points. And then you switch to the explanation based on Hartree uh, when the minimum of the dispersion is at gamma point. And my question is this, do you think that it's either or uh, or you see in different parts of the sample different behavior. And so we have a combination of both. Yeah, let me stop here and just ask this two questions. Okay, great. So uh, let me start with your first question, uh, particle hole asymmetry. So, you know, one fact about these samples, and I honestly don't know how important this fact is, but this sample does have explicit C2 symmetry breaking. 
uh, because one of the graphene layers uh, appears to be aligned with the boronitrite that it sits on top. Um, and so because it is likely that it's only one of the graphene sheets that is aligned and the other one that's twisted is not aligned with the boronitrite mm -hmm. that's above it, you see that now there is an asymmetry in terms of when you apply, when you change the density, you're pushing the charge density closer to the aligned side versus closer to the unaligned side. And what we believe is going on is that uh, the uh, electron side is the side where uh, the system is, the, you know, the density in the system, the electric field basically perpendicular to the two layers is pushing the system towards the HBN, uh, namely uh, it favors the broken state. And we have a lot of indications of suggesting that uh, starting from charge neutrality and on the electron side, C2 symmetry is broken. Mm -hmm. On the whole side, what happens is that we're pulling the charge away from that HBN, suggesting that maybe C2 symmetry breaking is not that important. And so maybe there the physics of cascade is more robust, uh, mm -hmm. et cetera. But of course, this, the, the subject of this talk is to some extent at larger magnetic field. You know, Some of it persists down to zero field, but you see a lot of these interesting features on the whole side do also appear at larger magnetic field namely one, uh, the breaking of this sum rule that I mentioned, and two, mm -hmm. uh, the presence of really interesting, and I didn't have time to talk about more complex fractional churn insulators that are seen, uh, but you see the red lines here. They all have really peculiar intercepts and slopes, and, and they're there, and we don't really understand mm -hmm. their nature, and so I think it transcends this kind of uh, symmetry, but, but I don't really know. We don't have measurements done on samples where we know that C2 symmetry is not broken. So I don't know to say whether this is really a crucial component or just a um, uh, something that exists in the system. Mm -hmm. Now, as, as to your question about this heart tree contribution and whether you can have both single particle physics and this interaction picture playing at the same time, I believe the answer is yes. So I didn't have time to show at all spatial dependence of any of these features. They uh, typically, you can find islands of stability of the phenomena that we're reporting here that spans, you know, on the order of a micron or maybe a little bit more than a micron. Mm -hmm. uh, and then you would find very different behavior in some other locations where you can't see the fractional churn insulators or you see more conventional behavior, etc. So uh, clearly there are parameters. And, and in fact, uh, you can even see just as a function of position the appearance and disappearance uh, and weakening and strengthening of different features in the spectrum, which means that there are many more parameters that I think govern the physics, which is not surprising. You know, if you have relatively flat bands, very, you know, many different small perturbations could influence the physics in a dramatic way. And I don't think we have a handle as to what these, what these knobs are. So I think there is much more to figure out. Thanks very much. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Uh, the next question by Sarab. Uh, hi, uh, Professor. I have a very nice talk. Uh, so I have a few questions related to this. Maybe uh, first uh, in this field itself, people always talk about that the C2 symmetry either can be broken by aligning with the HBN, either you apply a magnetic field to break the time reversal symmetry. So is it not possible to apply an in-plane magnetic field also and you can break the time reversal symmetry? But all the data when people so always observe at the finite perpendicular magnetic field. Right. So yes, I, I you're absolutely right. In plane magnetic field breaks time reversal symmetry. Um, whether that. So so yeah, I I don't know. I I I don't know to answer your question. I can tell you that the experiments in Weizmann have been done with in plane magnetic field, and I don't remember right now whether they see breaking of. Uh, time reversal symmetry as a function due to that. Um, remember that the, the value of the churn bands that you have uh, is in response, you know, basically it says that the system has transverse conductivity in the plane, sigma xy. So I think that naturally couples to an out of plane magnetic field and does not naturally couple to an in plane magnetic field, but I need to think more about this. Okay, uh, the in-plane magnetic field will clearly break spin symmetry, 
And so since the bands are characterized by, you know, spin and valley and, and these kind of quantum numbers, I think that I do believe that you should be able to break time reversal symmetry with an in-plane field, but it might require a much larger magnetic field because you're coupling to the spin and not the orbital motion. Maybe uh, I can ask my second question, uh, which is related to this uh, observation of fractional channel insulator between filling factor three and four. So here you have observed the channel insulator, fractional channel insulator at 10 by three and the 11 by three. So can you think it in terms of like, um, means uh, three plus one by three and three plus two by three states, which seems like a one by three and two by three uh, fractal quantum Hall state in log in this lattice kind of the structure. So, yes. it, so is it possible to think something about the edge state in uh, for these fractional states and the possibility of the counter propagating state in two by three like state in this fractional challenge later state? Yes, the answer is yes to all your questions. Uh, basically, you're right. This could be thought of as a one third, um, one third fractional quantum Hall state. Um, but ag again, remember the, uh, the magnetic fields in which this fractional churn state appears is very, very low uh, yeah. in relation to the magnetic field that's needed in order to open up uh, fractional quantum Hall states in the Hofstadter band structure. So the origin of these churn insulators is not the quantiz quantizing nature of the magnetic field, but rather this explanation that I had about the flattening of the Berry curvature. Um, and yes, you should expect uh, uh, interesting edge states. And in fact, the two thirds that you mentioned versus the one third, you know, in principle could be a two component uh, yeah. fractional quantum Hall state. So, you know, there are interesting questions on whether it should be spin polarized or spin unpolarized. So there are many, many open questions as to what the nature of these churn states are. And I wanna point out that that you see the red lines here everywhere else. These are also fractional churn states. They're not necessarily with denominator three uh, and are very interesting and should have interesting edge contributions to them as well. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, guys.